So this video is going to be the first in a series of four videos that we're doing about some advanced use cases of Redis. Redis is a key value in memory data store, meaning that it's really good for caching use cases or anything where your data is inherently ephemeral. But in this video, we're going to be talking about some interesting ways that we can add persistence to Redis, making it so that we can use Redis as a primary database for certain use cases. So to sort of put this into perspective, let's first take a look at some of the differences between Redis and a typical database. So with Redis, like I said, this is a key value data store. So we have something like a dictionary structure in memory where we have keys and values that are associated with them. The values in Redis can have various data types. So for example, Redis supports arrays, numbers, strings, and even some more interesting data types such as sorted sets. A typical relational database, on the other hand, has a much more complex structure. It consists of multiple tables consisting of rows and columns, and those tables can be tied together by correlating the values of two of the columns. So in this case, the last column here corresponds to the first column in this other table. So we can sort of tie this data together from this first row and this other first row. With Redis, the way that we're accessing this data is the same way we'd access something like a map or a dictionary in a programming language, where we're simply getting the value for a particular key. We can do things like search through the keys, but that's not going to be an efficient operation because we have to scan through every single key that exists in the data store. With a relational database, we can index certain columns. So we can create an index on this first column, for example, and that allows us to efficiently, usually in O of n time, look up a particular row given its value for that particular column. Taking a look at the querying capabilities of these two solutions, Redis is very simple. We input a key and Redis outputs a value associated with that key. Like I said, we can again search through the keys if we want to, and that is necessary for certain situations, but that can be a really expensive operation and can actually slow down the performance of the entire Redis server. With a relational database, on the other hand, we're inputting a much more complex query. For example, here we're taking two tables and joining the results together by some condition and then filtering the results on some other condition. And then our database is going to output for us a table representing all of that information. That's the cool thing about relational databases is that we can input queries that are arbitrarily complex and get arbitrarily complex data out of them. With Redis, our use cases are much more limited because of the key value nature of the data store. However, adding that restriction also means that we're opening up a lot of performance gains because of it. So now let's take a look at storage, which is probably the most interesting thing about Redis. With a relational data database, the data set is stored entirely on disk, and RAM is only used as a cache when accessing the data on disk. This can be both a write cache and a read cache, so we can either be caching results that we found from the disk, or caching results that we haven't yet written out to disk in memory. RAM is hundreds or even thousands of times faster than disks usually, so databases will try to keep most of the data set in memory so that it can be queried quickly. With Redis, on the other hand, the entire data set is stored in memory and is never persisted to disk. So what's interesting about this is that your entire data set has to be small enough to fit in memory on your server, and if the server fails, you would lose all of your data. So for caching, which is a typical use case of Redis, this is completely fine because we can simply refetch all of the data and cache it in the database. Nothing is permanently lost. However, for other use cases, we need to have the data persisted. So Redis does have some features built in that allow it to persist data to disk optionally. So some common use cases for Redis are as a cache layer, like I said, for computations or database queries. So if we have some expensive computation that we need to perform, we can cache the result, save it in Redis, and then access it very quickly later. Any ephemeral data is also really nice for storing in Redis, things like session storage or distributed locks. These are things that don't require persisted data to be stored on disk. It's completely okay to store all of that in memory and take the performance gains that come with using Redis. Redis is also common used as a place to store results from streaming data processing. So we could have some streaming data coming in, we're processing it in real time, and then the aggregated data can be stored in Redis. If you want to learn more about use cases of Redis and other caching systems, be sure to check out our Systems Fundamentals course on interviewpen.com. So now let's take a look at persistence, enabling Redis to perform even wider use cases by storing data on disk. The first and probably most simple way of doing persistence in Redis is called RDB, or Redis Database. So when we start off, of course, Redis is exclusively storing its data in memory. And what what RDB does behind the scenes is every, say, five minutes, it'll fork the Redis process, creating a child process with the same data in memory, and then that child process will be responsible for dumping the data from memory onto disk. So essentially, we're creating a backup of the in-memory Redis database every five minutes. If the Redis server happens to fail and the data in memory is lost, we can still restore the latest RDB snapshot from the disk. So for some use cases, this is certainly enough. In a lot of use cases, we need to have 
some backup of our data, but we don't need it to be perfect. With a solution, if our child process is being spawned every five minutes, we could lose up to five minutes of data when the server fails for whatever reason. And another interesting drawback of this solution is that it can take time for Redis to fork itself and create this child process. Behind the scenes, the operating system has to copy or at least allocate pages for the data in memory of the child process. And if Redis is storing a lot of data, this can actually take a decent amount of time to do. While Redis is working on forking this child process, because Redis is single threaded, the server will block and won't accept any additional requests, which can slow down upstream clients. So another solution that Redis has for persistence that solves some of these issues is AOF or append only file. So with AOF, instead of storing the entire Redis data store to disk, we're instead saving an append only log of all of the right operations that have ever been made to the database. So for example, if we set the key A to five and then increment the key A and then increment the key A again, that'll be three commands saved to the append only log. The reason we're calling this append only is because we can only write to the end of this log by adding new commands. We can never overwrite previous data. This is really nice in terms of disk access because it means our database never has to seek to a different location on disk or look up where some data should be stored. It's always writing to the end of the log, so it's very easy to do that quickly. As we're writing data into Redis, the data is of course going into memory to be stored, and it'll simultaneously be written to this append only log in memory. And then every say second, we can flush the append only log onto disk to ensure the data is permanently saved. We don't really lose any performance by doing this because writing to the end of this log is a very, very fast operation for Redis. And syncing the data to disk can be done behind the scenes by the operating system. If Redis is doing this sync to disk every second, that does mean we can lose up to one second of data. Big improvement from our five minutes in the last solution, but still could be a problem for certain use cases. If we want to, we can even tell Redis to sync to the file system after every write operation. This of course will slow down any writes to Redis because we have to wait for the sync to happen before we can finish our write, but it does mean that we're 100% certain that all data that we write to Redis will be permanently saved to disk, no matter when the server fails. Now, of course, this append-only log will become infinitely large as we continue writing and updating data in Redis. So what we have to do is consolidate the log into the smallest possible version by bundling up all of the previous commands that we've written in, and essentially just writing in the value associated with every key so that we end up with a smaller resulting file. To do this, every, say, hour, Redis will spawn a child process, which again has a copy of this append-only log, and then this child process can consolidate all of the data in this log and write it out to disk, and then once it exits, the main process can start using that file instead of the old one to write its new commands. So we do still have the same forking problem that we had with our RDB solution, where every hour Redis may stall for a little bit while it's forking this child process. However, with AOF, we have to do this process much less frequently than with RDB. Unfortunately, even with this consolidation process, the AOF file that's stored on disk is still going to be significantly larger than an equivalent RDB file because it has to store the entire history of commands. So for really large data sets where we're constrained on disk space, this might be a problem. However, this is also super useful for some situations. For example, if we accidentally send the flush all command, which deletes all the data in the database, we can simply stop the server, remove the flush all command from the end of the append only log, and then restart the server, and Redis will be able to rebuild the entire database without using that command. Pretty cool. So if our Redis instance does happen to fail, what we have to do is read the entire append only log from disk and then replay every command. This is essentially as if the Redis process is just running all of the commands in sequence in the append only log when it starts up. So as I mentioned, this does have the advantage of being able to strictly control what commands the Redis database runs in order to get to the resulting data set, but it can take a little bit of time at startup, especially if we have a really large database. So if we want to make sure that we're able to instantly restart our Redis server if something fails, RDB might be a better solution than AOF. Another really important thing to remember about Redis is that it'll usually be replicated across multiple nodes. So we can have a master node that all of our data gets written to, and then the master will copy all of that data to a replica or multiple replicas, and our clients can then read data from those replicas. Even if the master fails and we have no persistence set up at all, we can still copy all of the data from the replica back to the master, and we keep a perfectly up-to-date copy of that data. So this is another important thing to remember when using Redis as a database. Even if we're using a snapshotting solution such as RDB to protect against catastrophic failures that affect all of our Redis nodes, we're still protected in most situations from losing that five minutes of data because we have replication enabled. So now that we understand how we can persist 
persist non-ephemeral data on Redis, let's think about some additional use cases that this opens up. So first of all, any really simple key-based access pattern that we have is going to be a great use case for Redis. Something like a link shortener, where the only data we have to store is the shortened link which maps to the real link, we might as well take advantage of the added speed and simplicity of Redis and use that as our solution instead of a more complex database. There's also a lot of situations where Redis data structures can be super useful. Redis is able to store interesting data structures, such as a sorted set or a hyperlog log, as the value to a certain key, and this can make certain use cases a lot easier to implement with Redis in comparison to a different database. So for example, an online leaderboard is a perfect use case of a sorted set, where we're sorting a bunch of unique keys and sorting them by a value associated with them. And finally, any situation where very, very low latency is important, it may be worth trying to use Redis as a primary database to be able to achieve that latency. Redis is hundreds of times faster than a traditional database on average, and even on a standard network, Redis can be as fast as 100 microseconds to query. So for really latency-sensitive applications, such as real-time scoring or trading systems, it may be necessary to use Redis because speed is really important. It's also worth noting that a single Redis node is single-threaded, so it handles concurrency problems really nicely. So this can also be helpful for certain use cases. So while Redis is cool and persistence does open up a lot of interesting use cases, there's still a lot of situations, in fact, most situations where Redis is definitely not the right solution. If we have complex queries or complex data models that we want to store in our database, Redis is definitely not the right option. We can only store keys and values efficiently, so using something like a relational or document-based database is going to be a better fit for those use cases. Furthermore, if we have a large or growing data set that can't fit entirely in memory, such as time series data especially, Redis is not going to be a good fit for this because Redis has to store everything in memory. A traditional database can intelligently cache the data that you need in memory while storing the rest of it on disk, and that can be a really important feature for large databases. Finally, if we need very strict durability without having the overhead of an append-only write log, a traditional database is going to be a better solution because we can persist data to disk normally without having to use features like RDB or AOF. So again, this is going to be our first of four videos about some advanced Redis use cases, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see more. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord, where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.